sit back in your seats, get something to eat, and watch this movie. Don't let the kitty see it, because, well, then, let, we'll let you hear the, the, the um, video. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Left of the Projector. I am your host, Evan, back again with another film discussion from the left. I'm happy to announce that you can now sign up and be a paid subscriber to the show directly from Spotify. So you can just pop on there and support the show. Also, if you would be so kind as to smash that ratings button on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening to this show, right now as always you can follow the show on tiktok and instagram at left of the projector pod enjoy the show this is left of the projector we're here to discuss the barbarian probably one of my favorite horror movies of last year and joining me we have jolly leftist and comrade cutie pie Thank you both for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think, I don't remember uh, whether I saw this. I think I might've told you to see this uh, movie originally like a a couple months ago. And it really threw me for a a loop the first time. It's super creepy and a different kind of horror movie. I don't know, just like your overall impressions. Again, like spoilers are cool. You know, what did you, uh, what do you make of this as just being like a horror movie, forgetting all the cool themes we'll get into just like as a, as a movie, did it work for you? Hell yeah. It was really original, the plot. So for horror movies, that's really important. That's almost like what makes a good one these days is how original can you be with the plot? Um, also what really struck me as original with this, with this specific movie, I really liked Tess, the leading lady. She is a very good leading lady for horror, like how scream queens have come, how far they have come. Like she's practical, she's logical, she's she like thinks about how to deal with the monster in a pragmatic fashion. Like think about the last house on the left or the cha- chainsaw massacre. Bitches just screaming, running around. <laughs> it's like a different different type, and I really like that. I mean, she's logical most of the time, but then then she has like a whole morality issue where she like just Mm. runs into the dungeon. She's like, all right, I'm going to come save you. (laughs) It's like, get the fuck out of there, dude. (laughs) Yeah, she's got the hero complex going. That's true. Like, I think the hero complex actually that makes perfect sense. And it's, you know, she wants to be the savior. But I mean, she doesn't know, uh, you know, AJ's the guy played by Justin Long. She doesn't know like what he is, his background. She doesn't know he's this total douchebag. So she's just saving another person. Like I suspect maybe if she knew what he was all about, maybe she'd have second thoughts. I wonder that myself. If she knew, would would she have gone back? Yeah, because he didn't seem like a big actor. Like he was seeming like he was an actor in Hollywood, but he wasn't exactly a movie star. So it's not like people were going to recognize him, you know, yeah, there's um, the scene. He went to the storage facility, and that the the clerk didn't recognize him, and he was all annoyed. So they kind of made a a, a, t- a tip off to his his fame level. Yeah, I didn't catch that, but that makes sense. It, it gave me like he the character gave me like huge like Drake Bell vibes. Yeah. From, like, Drake and Josh. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> so funny. Didn't he have a whole sex scandal too in like Latin America a couple years ago? I think so. I mean, he, he had like a whole thing where he like ended up like maybe was going to go to jail. Um, I didn't really care a whole lot about it. <laughs> what? <laughs> Just kidding. I think what's what I think what for me, I think this maybe we'll get then get into some of the things about the movie itself. But for me, any good horror movie gives you sort of, you know, you, th- you think of movies sometimes as sort of like the. The, the sort of like three different phases or three different, you know, uh, sections. I feel like this movie that the long amount of time you got before you saw the title credit for the barbarian, I think it was like 40 minutes, but you were not at all bored or there wasn't that much humor. Like you sometimes get in a, in a horror movie that, you know, good horror movies 
but I think it like had just enough intrigue for me that it was like, I, I didn't feel, I just said bored. I, I didn't feel like I was waiting for, I mean, I, I was waiting for something to drop, you know? Yeah. No stories that take their time to develop are usually the best ones. And this is a classic example. I mean, it almost, it kind of like felt like it was all, like more than one movie kind of like meshed together just because of like how distinct the, uh, the differences are between like each act. Yeah. Cause the first act goes on for like, basically like, what is it? Like almost like 30, 40 minutes. Yeah. I think it's almost 40 actually. Like, like nothing happens. And then until like you're down there and shit is going on. You know what I mean? Yeah. When Keith gets, get, gets off, yeah. I, I, that's the, the end of the first act. If we're going to talk exactly. about like, sort of context. And then as soon as that happens, it's like, there's a very like, like immediate switch to like, everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Like we're, <laughs> driving around in, in california or whatever the f- fuck that guy is like you're you're literally in like this terrible neighborhood in detroit in like a dungeon <laughs> cave something or other yeah and then you're like in sunny california because in the first part of the movie there really isn't much the only outdoor scene is when she drives to her interview you know like everything is inside it's very contained you mean like the stands? yeah exactly I mean, I'm, I made sure that I came into it with, like, like as little knowledge about it as possible. I mean, I'm, I'm terrible with horror movies, but for some reason this didn't really get me. Um, <laughs> but um, the whole time, like, in the beginning, I was, like, writing notes about, like, the first guy. At, what is it? Keith, right? Yeah, Keith. I was, like, writing notes about the first guy. I was, like, I'll, I'll give you, like, a, like, I literally go, man seems, uh, seems pushy at first, very awkward. Seems like he he wants to get laid, you know. <laughs> and then I was like, after twenty minutes, I was like, all right, maybe he's not that bad. Maybe he's not a bad guy. I don't know. <laughs> well, I think that like is a perfect segue to. I feel like probably could easily be seen as like the number one theme of the movie. Is you sort of have Act One, which is you know until Keith gets uh, gets killed, and then the second half where you have AJ as like the second really the only other main male character. And like at first glance, you're like, oh, well, Keith is kind of a nice guy, you know, as you get to know him. But AJ, like off the bat, he's just an ass. But at the, when I feel like when you dig a little deeper, they're both not great. You know, I feel like Keith is kind of taking advantage of a situation. And I actually yeah. have, uh, that's a lot to, to say, but I have one curiosity is Keith seemed to know this documentary that, uh, Tess had been uh, or was interviewing with the director and seemed to have this connection. But I wondered if that was like, if he was lying, like if, but I guess that's kind of a hard pull out of nowhere to know this random documentary. Well, as far as Keith is concerned and watching the beginning, I for one would not have stayed in the house when he's like, Oh, you can stay here. Yeah. Swerve. 100% 100% swerve. So right off the bat, um, they said like the, the the writing and the way they told the story as a female person, I felt uncomfortable and I felt her apprehension. So I thought that was that was good. And Keith, like what you were saying, Evan, I don't know if he's all that great either. Uh, I thought that he might have been a representation of a of a certain spectrum of toxic masculinity, where, whereas AJ is obviously one spectrum, but Keith is another one. He's the the nice guy, you know? He, uh, she's trying to explain that she was a little nervous about staying and he's all like, what, do I look like a monster? Like, don't play, <laughs> dude, don't, don't, don't do that. Like, you know why she's nervous. Like, why, that smells like not all men. Slash, he played Pennywise, so he'd be looking creepy. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he was clearly pressuring her in a way that like and, and, and it's funny like all the little like cues you think of like because because i also came into this movie knowing nothing about it so i had no idea what the horror kind of like the the reveal was going to be but i felt like he was definitely pressuring her to stay you know like he wasn't taking no for an answer and as we hear later when aj is at the bar with his friend in downtown detroit and he's asking him, like, what happened with this woman? He's like, oh, I didn't, you know, I'm persistent. I didn't take no for an answer. So it's kind of like the same thing. It's just kind of a degree. 
right? Yeah, I didn't even yeah, catch it. He was like, um, it just took a little convincing is all, I think was exactly what he said. Yes, right? yes. Blurred consent and two different spectrums. Yeah, exactly. I think that's, you know, and, and I think obviously this movie came out in 2022, probably was filmed, you know, a year or two before. So given the time frame of when, you know, uh, a lot of the Me Too movement, I feel like they were clearly sliding that in, but not in a way that felt, I mean, it was, it was obvious, but it didn't feel forced in, in my view. It was well done. Um, and I think with the, the Me Too movement uh, nod or homage, whatever, um, was when J- Justin Long's character was all um, saying, like, is it like me losing my reputation and my career? That's not sad or something along those lines He's on the phone with his mother. Yeah, he sounded like a, sounded like a charming uh, individual when he was having that conversation. It's like a cliche right right off of, you know, like 4chan or something. It's like, I've heard it a million times. Yeah, I mean, at, at first when he, when he came up, I was like, ah, I mean, I, I don't know. It's, people give curveballs all the time. I, I won't assume that he's a rapist. So like my notes, it literally goes new character, question mark, AJ. I don't know. And it goes maybe rapist. And then the next scene happens and I just go rapist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He was a yeah. character. They wrote him so well. And I, I don't know. I feel like Justin Long as that character kind of, you know, was pretty good. I don't feel like I hadn't seen a movie with him in quite a while. I, I, mean, I know he's, Like he, he's usually, this isn't usually his character. He's usually like <laughs> actually the nice guy. Yeah. You know? So it was kind of funny to see him as this. You remember him in Galaxy you know. Quest? That was his debut film. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Galaxy Quest was great. I love that movie. You know, you talked about when, when Tess comes in, she's feeling uncomfortable. You know, I think it's it's safe to say that, you know, I as a man watching this movie have a different, you know, perspective of it. But I felt uncomfortable for her. Like there was all these weird tension moments. You know, they were when they were doing the when they were washing the sheets and they kept showing the laundry machine. It was like a such a weird but cool shot too. I felt like all of the the shots down the hallway were really awesome, but it, yeah. I, I just felt like the, the discomfort for her. And I, I think that's probably what women probably experience all the time. And I think it's rarely acknowledged. I think the cinematographer did that on purpose. Yeah. I, I would, I would agree that they did it on purpose for sure. Cause it's like, uh, her room is like down the hall from the, her, like basically her own main exit out of there. And he is sleeping on the couch between the exit and her. You know what I mean? So like I feel like the shot kind of shows like the like the distance that it would it would like really feel like if you're looking down that hallway trying to get out of there. Yeah. And he's like this obstacle. Yeah. The the weirdest part I uh, I didn't catch it at first on like the first watch was when he was like, Yeah, I you know, I didn't pour any because I I thought you would think it was weird and you wouldn't drink any if uh if if you didn't see me pour it myself. And I mean, like kind of like implying that, like he assumed that she would think that he was going to like drug her. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then he went on yeah. later being like, why were you scared? I'm not scared. Yeah. Well, it's funny when, when he was making the tea initially, I was thinking like, Oh, is he, is he going to drug her? Like that was my immediate reaction just because of the, like the, the feeling of the scene is like, she has this, constant her face is constantly just you you can just like see the fear and the apprehension until he mentions that documentary that he had seen and then like all of a sudden like her like she relaxes she drinks some wine and she like has a good time it's a it's such a i don't know like i feel like this scene is relatable not because i've been in the scene but i can understand it as a in other movies or like seeing it in real life, you know, you're like out somewhere and you kind of see two people on a date and it's like really uncomfortable. And then like you have a drink of wine or like, Oh, well we can have a conversation now. Yeah. There's definitely like a, like a super drastic, like release of tension at like one point in the, uh, in that act. In the wine, the catalyst. Yeah. yeah I, I think I wrote down like the emotion sort of turns like her apprehension kind of sl- slowly fades a little bit, but she's still kind of unclear. And then, I mean, we can maybe skip to, or not skip to, but kind of 
flip to the evening and the thing about i mean great horror movies is you have like you know doors that open and close i feel like this has those perfect little moments like her door is open when she's sleeping and you're like oh is there someone in there is he actually the 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 killer or the the whatever you want well, to i call thought it, he so. was i thought keith was a bad guy until he got murked oh so you think so you even when he went down there thought you thought he, he was a bad like, guy all the way until he got murked to be honest with you yeah but, I, I thought she, he was like sort of trying to like lure her down there i thought that was his mattress because, yeah because when she goes down there nothing is really like bad happening like there's no real like 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 you can tell that like there's bad shit down that hallway but you it's it doesn't seem like it's very like immediate of a threat but like when when he goes down there and then you know she goes down after him like you can like like you already know there's at least one person down that hallway like she could totally like get like totally fucked you know what i mean like <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I was trying to like think back because I've I've seen it. Uh, I think I've seen it three or four times. Uh, I watched it a couple nights ago before this, and I'm trying to like picture if I, yeah, because like it's it's one of those things that sometimes when you watch a movie and you thinking back on it, you're like, oh, of course I knew that that was going to be the tw- turn, but like, no, you didn't know that shit. <laughs> and I don't think I I don't think I did too. I think I still thought he was. I thought maybe he wasn't the killer, but he was like luring her, luring her to the killer. I think that's what's my when that when the monster came out i was like whoa because i really thought keith was about to be the villain yeah i i 100 thought that he was the landlord that like double booked it like on purpose at first (laughs) (laughs) i thought he was diabolical bro And, and you know what's weird that i was just thinking this is like skipping ahead when aj enters the picture he goes to the the place to pick up the key for the place and they didn't have any record of these reservations it's like are they just like is it just supposed to say like they don't these like airbnb landlord types of things are just so disorganized and a total shit show that they didn't even know there was multiple guests staying there possibly i don't remember taking notes or no diss of this aspect i know this this that that's like that's kind of a it's not really necessary to the to the plot to it but i think um you know i don't know i think uh what was i going to mention here i don't think i had anything else related to sort of the class aspect but i mean it definitely you know is showing you know the whole scene with aj and his mom on the phone and his whole character arc i feel like it's very much weaving in like just a general sense of you know patriarchy i know we're like 20 minutes in and no one has mentioned the word capitalism (laughs) Shame on us. Um, but that's for Act Two, know, ladies kidding. and gentlemen. No. <laughs> yes, Act Two. Yes, yes. We have to have the title sequence uh, or the the title screen. But I feel like the like the I, I noted down just like being like a very, you know, th- these are things that are just kind of expected and are not. You know, this could these kind of things could these kind of themes could be in another movie that's not a horror movie, and you just kind of accept them as part of or most people would just kind of accept them as like the norms of society. Like some guys are, are assholes and some guys are like the nice guy. And, and, you know, I feel like it's just our expectation of patriarch patriarchal, you know, structure that tells us that that's how it goes. It's nice to see it being depicted as what it truly is a horror. Yes. I mean, I think that's, I think we discussed this in our uh, episode on Candyman is that, you know, the horror of capitalism being depicted in horror movies, I feel like is like the almost like the perfect genre for those things because inherently a horror movie is scary <laughs> and Socialism. it can bring those themes in, right? I th- was it during that? Yeah, episode? I think that sounds that sounds right. Uh, but yeah, so I, I thought I'd mention that, but I think you know we're kind of at the point now where Keith, I guess Keith now has has gone down, but the conversation where she wants to leave and he's like, oh, I just want to go see it i feel like this was a first of like a couple different specific scenes where like women are not to be believed they're hysterical crazy people who if they say there's something wrong it's actually not true like he doesn't take her word for it it, there'd be no movie they would have left it everyone would have been fine yeah it would have been it would have been a 30 minute short uh short story but no but yeah the the, like the this is constant like his emotion of just being, oh, but 
you know, I don't remember the exact dialogue he says. Um, no, I, I didn't write it down, but he's like, oh, but I need to see this. I, he's like constantly going back and be like, oh, I need to go look and see this room. He's like, oh, maybe it's just a room. I feel like I remember her being like, there's a bed and a camera. And he's like, why would yeah. there be a bed and a camera? What? Because someone enough films down there. Like, get it together. <laughs> Let's leave. Yeah. Well, I mean, didn't and the, and this dude is like from the area. He's scouting. He's clearly in what's was later made obvious to be a very bad part of town. Why would that be so surprising? That there was some like shady ass shit happening in the. Which that is basement. why I thought he was in on it until the very end. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's a pretty good, pretty good assumption. To he be was honest. too naive. Uh, I mean, she's packing up all her stuff and she wants to go and. And then she feels like, I think now, which I think is one of a few instances where she feels, um, I don't want to say remorse, but she feels some sense of... Survivor's that, guilt? Yeah, or something like that. I mean, I guess it's like a common, you know, kind of tropey type of thing in like a horror movie. Like something, someone could be in danger. So rather than just like getting the, sh- the hell out of there, saving yourself, you go back. She goes back. Like she has... Some empathy for him. She likes him a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I commend her for it. I don't know if I do the same thing. It's hard to say until you're there, but. I can see myself getting down to the basement, down like past and to that like extra door, like where they like discovers that it goes even deeper. And then I'd be like, all right, sorry, bro. Like you decided to go down there. I didn't. So like, I got to get out. Like I I would get down far enough. But like, shit like that. Mm-mm. Nope. No. The cave. Yeah. Exactly. A whole network. There was a catacomb under that house, guy. <laughs> yeah, which also, also is like an interesting thing that that was built under there. I was like trying to figure out. Code, it, dude. Can't be up to code. <laughs> no, no, no. That 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 landlord AJ's uh, AJ would lose that house if they uh, came out there and inspected. Yeah, dude. About, his property taxes are about to go. <laughs> well, that like one hundred percent goes over so many people's property lines. Like, it's totally fucking with the pipes. Like, for real. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I guess it's the idea. Well, what I don't understand. I mean, I presumably the guy who's the old dude who is the you know the rapist who's who that's the guy- who's the father. He obviously built that for her unless she built it for herself because he was pretty frail that's true some dads build tree houses you know he builds cave networks and cages Cages. well i mean like (laughs) he definitely will because they were saying later on that he like was making babies with the babies so like if you go down there you can see like cages and like like uh, bowls of like really old dog food type like dog bowls and shit. So the way that I see it is that like he started off with like maybe like a smaller area and then just kind of like naturally expanded from there, like over like the course of those like 40 or 50 years that they said that was going, my guess is it was going on for like 60 years. And then that monster is just 40 years old. I mean, yeah, yeah. The, the, the thing I think we'll get to, which is uh, I think one of the coolest well, I shouldn't say cool. It's one of the most interesting and telling scenes of the movie. But so I think I think now we like we're past the the credit opening, the sort of the barbarian comes on the screen. Now we're introduced to AJ, which I think we've already talked about, like his the toxic masculinity and his just being a real shithead. And he's constantly thinking about his own career. Like he's I think on the phone with his like agent, he's like, oh, that fucking bitch. Like he's immediately that's his immediate reaction to this as opposed to like, Oh, I wonder, I mean, I guess that's probably the inevitable reaction for most men. If they're accused of something like that, not like, Oh, I wonder what I can do to, to help them. It's immediately fuck them. And also what's interesting about AJ and his accountabilities is that he denies accountabilities to his agent and to his friend at the bar. But when he calls the girl hella drunk, He actually uses language that takes ownership. So he knows he's full of shit. He knows he's accountable. He knows he graped her. Yeah. It's like he his only his only moment of actual 
feelings is he's drunk and he sees that he's in a in a real hole now because of what he's done and he's trying to have a moment of actual clarity but it, i think he's just fake as press on nails but that's nice yeah yeah he sure is um what was the other thing i was going to mention about him too um but yeah the the whole like his whole like uh trip to go out there where he's you know he has a bunch of properties and I guess he's for some reason, of course, one of those like there is no like you said, like there is no move if he doesn't choose this house. But he clearly had like multiple properties and he's going to this one out in the, you know, in the kind of a bad neighborhood in Detroit. And the only thing he's thinking of when he's there is the value of this property. Like there's no other consideration in his head. He hasn't considered his the this person who he, you know, raped or whatever, any of that. It's just Oh, you know, can I look up if a basement counts as square footage of my house? Mm. Which is one of the funniest scenes in the whole the movie. The tape too. measure. Yeah, he's like, oh, yeah. shit, bro. That's crazy. Look at this. Like, I'd be so happy, though, if I stumbled upon a cave like that. I would actually be so juiced if I went to an Airbnb and found that. That'd be so fun. Yeah, just as long as there's no, like, murder room, I'd be okay with it. If it's, like, a wine cave Yeah, or if it's just, like, you know, an old diamond mind. I don't know. <laughs> There's there's just like oh uh, just, just like a room filled with treasure. Yeah, I don't know. That'd be that'd be fun. Uh, yeah, and, and so we've we said this before is that he is basically a landlord too. So not only is he a piece of shit rapist who doesn't take accountability, he's also a landlord. <laughs> and not even like like the take- type of landlord that's like present and like fixes stuff every now and again, but like the type that doesn't even know that he owns the property. <laughs> yeah he bought the house like drunk one night like well because it's in a like knowing like the history of detroit and how the you know the city completely fell apart and especially during the housing crisis um you know when houses were even were just all getting lost i mean these neighborhoods were people were buying up property for you know nothing you know pennies on the dollar so presumably that's what he did he bought a bunch of properties and this is what you know what capitalists and landlords and the like do they buy up property when it's cheap and then when that neighborhood gets nice again they can jack up the price and kick out all the poor people and they even showed a juxtaposition of how nice that neighborhood was in the 80s they did that flashback where that dude went to the grocery store oh i gotta talk about this scene this is like the cool i think this is the coolest scene the the flashback well maybe not the coolest but i think there's a lot of things i want to mention about it. okay easily easily the funniest one of the funniest parts in the movie is they're like this place is going to shit we got to get out of here and like you look you look around and it looks fucking pretty all right like there's doesn't look like there's anything that could possibly be wrong involved there except for like frank like frank seems like the only bad guy involved in that situation (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, so yeah, the the thing you said about like the pristine grass, the lawn, like the little houses in a row, mm. you know, perfect little suburb. Um, and and when the, the, so the first line that I took note of when he gets into his car is he puts on the radio and the person on the air, it's like a, a news report. And he says, um, Ronald Reagan inherited the worst economy in 50 yeah. years. And it, it just like, it was such a, it was so funny. And then, cause then you look at the neighborhood and like that, like doesn't square itself, right? Like you have this actual somewhat of a middle class or working class neighborhood. That's nice. People can actually afford the house, you know? Then Reaganomics happened and Barbarian was able to be written. Yeah. I mean, and, and then he goes to the store and like the way he's driving around and in the store, it's all very, you know, neat. And he's like buying like, the Frank's buying all this stuff for like a home birth of one of his, you know, uh, women's children who he had raped. And the woman's just like helping him buy, you know, get all the stuff. And it's like that, that whole, that scene may be very uncomfortable too. Like he's, he's an uncomfortable dude. Just his vibe is complete sourness. Um, good actor though. Yes. Yeah. That guy. And then, and then the, and then the thing that sort of came, caught me by surprise is he was, setting up his next victim and it's like an endless parade of victims clearly because they had all those videotapes down there and he like goes into a house poses and that's like another thing too like in 1980 you would just let some random like utility person into your house just to walk around like i'm not letting anyone into my fucking house or my play Uh, but did you notice um 
in the car so he's in the car watching her right like the, his next victim mm -hmm. and i don't know if i'm actually accurate in this but so we it said that it was reagan right and then there was a commercial mm -hmm. playing on the radio and it was all like used cars even if you have bad credit wasn't credit scores in like 86 or 7 or something oh that's a, it's funny i took note of that exact same commercial because i was thinking about how at that time, it was the expansion of people like using credit cards to buy a bunch of stuff. Like that was the thing they were pushing. But I don't know. Like, did they have credit? That's yet? what I'm saying. I think I found an error, and I'm like excited about it. But I don't actually know if I found an accurate error. If I'm just, I can try to look that up right now. I have my computer open. Do it, cutie. Yeah, we we, we got we got we got to we got to do real time fact checking. And okay, so it says uh, like the FICO credit score was in 1989. Ah. Uh! Oh shit! We got a plot hole. Not a plot. Hole. So, but but was there some way that they could check your credit yeah. as early as 1980? But credit scores weren't not. a thing. I don't think. Right. Okay. So there must have been. I guess they could like call your bank and like see if you had money. Funny because I didn't think of it as being like an incorrect thing. I thought of it as. Well, I'm annoying. Just did. like an interesting thing. So okay. So here we go. I found another little thing. So it says apparently in like the mid seventies, there was something called like a, the 1970 fair credit reporting act and the equal credit opportunity act to discourage you, uh, unf unfair credit reporting. So it sounds like, like the FICO wasn't invented till later, but it seems like they did have some way to like, there was a forerunner type of thing going on. Yeah. It seems like that FICO and, e and Equifax were like the, modern credit scores or like yeah. the most you know the newer version of it seems like at the time i think we, we've 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 uh i'm gonna have to uh contact the uh director and see like oh did you understand your <laughs> you, you miss you miss you, you misrepresented credit scores in this movie they're like no 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 i actually did my research on this like <laughs> they're like this took three hours in pro in post-production to get settled all right like i know my <laughs> uh but yeah that that whole scene like very was super weird and you then see which is i think also one of those super cool things he's walking down the hallway in his house it's super 80s looking inside or 70s even and then you flash back to the floor and you have that same hallway so i really did like how they brought in that flashback to give you like context to the monster that he was that he created the monster in fact right he's frankenstein and his name is frank <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> Well, no, he's not Frankenstein. It's he's 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 a. Uh, what is yeah. Frankenstein? Frankenstein the monster. Yeah, Frankenstein. Fra he's Frankenstein. Yeah. The yeah, that's one of those common things that people always get wrong. That they say Frankenstein is the monster. And it's like no, Frankenstein was the dude. He made the monster, just not just not the same way. Different different methodology. <laughs> the other thing too that we that you know is another interesting again maybe just a a thing about Frank's character is. He's clearly maybe he built that tunnel down there to like bury all of the people he obviously then would have to kill, presumably, right? Because if he's has all these women and babies and they have them, you know, and all in this like this incest tree, he's killing a bunch of people too. Yeah, maybe he wants to bury his secrets down in his catacombs. And think of that yeah. as a burial temple. Yeah. I mean, I for for me, I didn't it seemed like he was he probably had more than one like woman at a time at least to like when you first go down there and you see that there's like the cages and everything yeah that, it implies it has multiple children in cages or multiple um victims in cages yeah because i i yeah. can't i can't see like him being able to i guess record him you know doing doing these heinous acts and then also having like a small section of that corner where it's like dedicated to like seven different people. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, and the the other thing that was there's this made me think of two things I hadn't before. Well, one, I think we should maybe like discuss a little bit like the mother character. But before that, I was thinking how in the in the later in the part where AJ is down in the tunnels and he kind of escapes and he then stumbles upon Frank like on his before he you know kills himself the mother won't go down there yeah. she seems to be afraid of him and it's interesting because you think that she would want to kill him but doesn't and i don't know it, it, it's like it's hard to analyze her character being like you don't really know much other than her like motherly instinct but it's a weird it's it's super weird 
I mean, it's <clears throat> it's possible that there were like other like like they they that, that monster the, the mother had like other siblings that tried to do that and then they got killed or something because Frank yeah. does have a gun, so right. I I don't know. Yeah, her whole her whole like and clearly he's he has to get all of these. You know, she's presumably not out getting supplies. I guess you know, like the milk and all these supplies, but she clearly has supplies. Yeah, you know? where did she get? And he's unable to go anywhere. So is she like out? She out just like going and like stealing shit. While oh, she comes out at night. That homeless dude said that maybe she goes hits the market. <laughs> the <South Carolina>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yo, you got you got. Can yeah, I get she, a twelve pack of condoms and uh, a mason jar and some some milk? Maybe I'll poke talking. a little hole in the condom. I'll put it on top. I'll give it to my babies. Like. <laughs> Well, yeah, like the bottle was really kind of creepy too. Like, I mean, why was, was it shiny? It, the top didn't have to be shiny. They didn't have to do that, but they did it. Yeah, that, I oh, I swear other... that bottle that bottle top was a condom just wrapped around a mason jar. Like... It, was, it was too shiny. <laughs> and the other thing that like like the some of the creepy things in this movie for me, like even the most, was that scene where they're AJ and Tess are in this cage, and she puts the bottle down. And AJ won't drink it, and there's like hair yeah. on the, like the nipple of it. And yeah. it was like I was like that was like the most I was like completely just gagging. I hated everything about that scene. Yeah, I was I was horrified because I I was like I wouldn't be able I would be screwed because I'm allergic to like milk. <laughs> I was like I'm gonna die. Like like no matter what, if I'm then in, in that situation, I'm fucking dead. I mean, what am I gonna do? Drink the milk? Like have like like go in, into like fucking shock? Not do be able to breathe or <laughs> huh? You go anaphylaxis from milk, or do you just get diarrhea? Anaphylaxis. So like I would be dead, and, like if I did not oh, have shit. it, I'm, I I'd be totally screwed. Dude, your whole life is Russian roulette. What the fuck? That's crazy. I think the the other couple things I want to mention we haven't talked about. We so we talked about earlier how like. Tess isn't believed by Keith and I think even AJ like doesn't seem to like believe her or trust her despite the fact that she's also captured in this dungeon. But then we have the two scenes where she escapes and she meets the cops for the first time she runs down the street and she sees the cops and she tells them she's kidnapped. I posted a video about this earlier, this, this scene and they're like, don't touch the car, ma'am. And like, they just assume she's crazy. And it's just like the cops, don't care like they know what's going on in this neighborhood is the impression i got like they like they know some fucked up shit is happening around here and they don't want any part of it that, that's how cops act in those areas i mean they they always assume they've seen it all for one and they always assume that everyone's a crackhead basically i mean she's very dirty she's clearly talking really fast and and you know needs help and they don't give a shit what's funny though is that she does not seem high at all not even a little bit. I feel like the cops might have been more inclined to believe her, but part of me is like, no, nah, they would have behaved just that way. I'll go back. Yeah, and then they well, then they do go down to the house, and I think the like the funny line in that scene is the cop says like, oh, you know, the only crime I see here is that you broke the window to this dilapidated shithole house in this dilapidated shithole neighborhood. Like, do they even like? Why would they give a shit? He didn't even actually care about the window. He didn't actually. Right, of, of emotion until she called him a name. That's when he's actually yeah. carried. Yeah, and then she threatens to take him down. And the only reason they don't like call her away, I think, is that there's like a shooting somewhere else, and like that's more exciting for the cops to go check. Yeah, out. all units, all units down. Yeah, the cops don't don't believe her. You know, that's like the constant theme too. I think is not just when it comes to sexual, uh, vic- you know women who are victims of sexual assault and harassment and they're not being believed like that thread goes across to cops not believing anything that you say you know when you need some kind of help i think they they pull that strand uh, nicely throughout the movie they did and only in like two scenes too with the cops and they portrayed that really well in just two scenes well she also calls the police and they basically i feel like they they don't seem like they're gonna send anyone. they don't have any yeah, they're they're literally like, sorry, we have no available units, and she's like, what? So nobody's coming, and they're like, we have no available units, nobody's coming, man. Like, <laughs> sorry. That happens all the time. 
Yeah, I was gonna say, but like if it was a white neighborhood or a nice part of town, like they, that's where all the cops are, I guess. They'd be calling motherfuckers from all over the place. They'd be like, "Oh, we have no available units. We better call on SEAL Team Six here, real quick." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, like the 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 theme of you know, just like the you know, I, I think this goes to Frank's character, you know, in the eighties from when the flashback was, and all of this is just like that overtone of just like the white supremacy of the town i mean like the 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 the, you know reagan basically destroyed that town if you think about it in a sense like manufacturing was dying he did nothing to save it and that killed detroit in some part and then he you know it's almost like reagan created this monster as much as frank did yeah reaganomics and then barbarian was written but i think the sort of like the very kind of final scene of this movie or the final scenes is when you know he goes back to save AJ gets him out of the house and they come across that same homeless person that they had found earlier and they kind of take refuge with him. And I thought like one of the funniest scenes and like, I feel like I, and this is one where I knew it was coming where they're, he's like, Oh yeah. Like the, the, she's never come here in this uh, water tower where I'm hanging out all the time. And then she like just literally like breaks through a solid wall. And yeah. It's like the fucking Kool-Aid man. Oh Yeah. <laughs> And he's like, he, he said specifically, she ain't never come in this motherfucker and cut off <laughs> so comedically genius. Immediately following that is you have AJ again, like only thinking of himself. He, she know he knows that, oh, oh, I guess we also skipped over the pack where he shoots her thinking that it's we all, the, the mother. Too. I, I honestly thought that was where the movie was going to end at first because I wasn't really paying attention to time. I thought that he just like shot her. She hit the, like the mother with the car Frank shot himself and that it was just going to like end with like this dude just leaving. Know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like just leaves her for dead, leaves the woman for dead, steals her car and just bounces. Uh, Yeah. I mean, I think that's a good, like, I think it's, I mean, I think that was probably intentional to give you the sense of like, there might be closure here. What with, with, with the shooting? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what you just said is that, you know, the, he gets he shoots Tess and then like he, he usually could have just run away and that could have been it. But you know, it continues. He like she's she makes it out of the house and and you know they and he helps her, you know, and, and that's the thing too, is that AJ's constantly like bragging several times about how he's like, Oh yeah, I came back for you, I helped you. Like he 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 so desperately wants to be seen as like the good guy like Keith, but he's just a piece of shit. He really is terrible. Yeah, well, there's like the there's like the moment I think at some point where it's kind of like it seems like he's trying to like be better, but like when push comes to shove, like later on, obviously he like decides that like being an asshole is just you know his move. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, he he had like I think this. I mean, you're probably referring to like the very last scene. They're on top of the water tower, yeah. and he knows that there's like this connection between the mother and Tess. And if he pushes Tess off the roof, she will jump after him, killing two birds with one stone, literally, or is his goal. And, you know, because she's somehow superhuman, like that's another thing about this movie that we just kind of skipped over and you just kind of accept it as being a horror movie. And, you know, some aspect of it is somehow like all the inbreeding gave her super strength. I didn't, I wasn't complained about that constantly to my boyfriend the entire time because it was really annoying oh that is like why is that yeah. it broke the car cars are made of steel it broke a steel so if a, if an engine is compromised that means the steel frame was compromised and that shit didn't kill her that would kill anyone yeah like didn't even like pierce her flesh well it damaged the car so if the collision can damage a steel frame i'm sorry you can be incest 10 decades over you're not more strong than yeah, maybe there's some like toxic sludge down in that in that cave down there that gave her some powers. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Like, like she's like the toxic, the toxic Avenger. Okay, I'll, I'll try and abide it, but it's hard for me. But I'll do it for you. <laughs> teenage mutant mama. <laughs> like... Yeah, teenage mutant mama. Oh man. But yeah, and then so she's also saying, so she pushes him off the thing and he's like, oh, and then he again sees that Tess like also survives. Like she's also gets shot, falls off a roof and she survives. And for his troubles of trying to kill both of them and like maybe the goriest scene of the whole movie is when the mother just gouges his like face and just destroys like like her strength is just unmatched. I like the pussy color. 
Is that too much? It was a yeah. Oh. It, it was like, it, it looked like, like if you had like a baked potato in your hand, you like smushed it. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what it looked like. And you it looked it, it, yeah, it seemed like just like milky baked potato. Yeah, with a little bit of pink. And I, I think the, I don't know if I was talking about it with one of you, but I think the other thing that I noticed after when, you know, he's dead and then, you know, the, the mother wants Tess to like go back with her and she sees the gun. I feel like she knew at that moment that she was going to die. Like it was finally going to be, you know, her misery and pain would be ended and like seemed like okay with it. Well, she had her baby. She was happy. That's all she cared about was... Was Tess cute, sweet? Oh, so 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 like she so she finally had someone to, to care for after all this. Yeah, time. I'm saying that she didn't care that she was gonna die because you know she's with her baby and it's all, yeah, it's purpose all. fulfilled, I guess. She accepts because you know they're together. Yeah, I mean the the main theme definitely seemed like a lot of like abused people sort of taking back their power to a certain extent where you can kind of see that like even though the mo- like the mother doesn't really get to kill frank she gets to kill like almost like a like a proto frank if you know what i mean and aj oh yeah cool yeah that's and a good then, point like it's almost like she yeah. saw she saw like him in her him in him. Yeah, and then, then you can sort of see that like Tess comes into it kind of like being sort of easily pushed around where, you know, obviously she doesn't want to come inside, but Keith is like, yeah, come inside. It's fine. And then she's like, ah, whatever, fine. And then she comes inside. She doesn't want to drink. She ends up drinking anyways because he kind of like pushes her into doing it. He, she wants to go home. He goes down into the basement. She follows him, you know, with, with AJ, all sorts of stuff where like, at the by the end of it it's almost like she's able to sort of take back her own power and be like the one that actually ends things no i mean yeah no yeah i can i can definitely see that i think the only kind of topic that we we kind of talked about all the different things like with the you know the urban like the maybe i didn't mention it this way but you know you could kind of see like the crumbling of that you know the the city within detroit and you know kind of how it you know led to all of these other issues within you know cities and suburban life and so the housing crisis and landlords and all of these different things i think it's a kind of a crafty inclusion of all of those themes by the by the director and writer i agree they uh they uh they help make it a well a well-rounded picture and experience because like the poverty and the whole like this whole atrocity being able to take place not like the movie itself but like what happened with the mother and frank like this a whole abuse story transpiring over all these years in a community and no one did anything, you know? Um. Yeah. Well, you know what I was just thinking when you said that? So remember in that flashback scene, like the neighbor is deciding to move because they want to move before it's too late. I mean, I, I, I was thinking about this now, this is kind of a non sequitur, but I wonder if it's because at that moment, you know, you're starting to see the, the, um, I don't know when like the big layoffs and things within like Ford motor company was, Perhaps, you know, jobs were dwindling and that's why the people nearby were trying to sell. I feel like the individualistic nuclear family model allows those sorts of things to take place. Because if it was more communal and more like we're all like Mikasa, Sukasa and shit like that, that he wouldn't have been able to hide it. Like it would have been weird that he's not with the fam. You know, it's weird he's not in the community. It's weird he's not on the block. So, I mean, I feel like the nuclear family paradigm and the individualism that runs rampant in our silly little society, boom. Barbara. But do you, I mean, so do you, but do you think that the, his neighbors would have found it peculiar that he wasn't, you know, married? Yeah, I do. Actually. You know, doesn't have kids. You yeah. know, they probably would have found that strange. Right? So, yeah. And presumably he's bringing back like all these supplies and things he's constantly needing for his horrible activities. I feel like if you're a neighbor, which I picture like the eighties of these people in their front lawns mowing and having beer with their neighbor, like you, you feel like you notice these kind of things, you know, I think it takes place in a time period where people were a little bit more focused on their own like finances, where they might've taken kind of like a blind eye to it with like stagflation and the recent election and all sorts of other shit where they're like, more focused on like more their own issues, especially if they're talking with like the only time that you see Frank talk to somebody who I presumed at first was like probably one of his like bigger friends. Cause it seemed like one of Frank's like only real emotions other than like, you know, 
fear slash shame and that like last like suicide scene <clears throat> was kind of like him seeming like sort of sad that like his friend was leaving the the neighborhood. You know what I mean? Yeah, like even though he was being a he was still a monster, it like somehow kept him grounded in yeah. this reality. I mean, clearly he already had somebody there because the next scene he walks into the house and then there's somebody screaming downstairs. Yeah. But <laughs> and yeah. he's like literally just coming home from like setting up his next operation. Frank is pretty bad. And he's so real too. He's not like the mama monster. He's like more like AJ, more more real life. And it's also, I feel like the era too, this is, I've, I wanted to do a movie where there's like a serial killer just, um, just because like generally you don't really see serial killers as much anymore like in the age of like DNA, like the era of, you know, there being all these kind of serial killers was like a very 80s. We thing. had one in Stockton just this year. He's still, he's still oh, at shit. large. Oh shit. Well, I stand corrected. <laughs> I guess there's, I guess maybe there's, maybe there's less focus on them. Yeah. I, well, I mean, the media is sort of like, was like really well people at least were talking a lot of shit about like the media like kind of like propping up a bunch of these um serial killers to kind of like almost like get other serial killers to pop up to get attention because obviously almost all of these like serial killers and then the mass shooters are always like you know lonely white dudes but now we've kind of shifted to just focusing on you know lonely white dudes who do mass murders instead of serial killing you know what i mean yeah, yeah, they've they've changed their uh, modus operandi. There's also like definitely enough mass shootings going on where they can kind of cover a, cover one every week or so. Where like the serial killing, they would be able to like follow a, a string of murders that might be connected over the course of like a, a year or so. You know what I mean? But any uh, any final notes or thoughts? They played the Mets on the outro. That was tight. Yeah. Yes. Renette's always kick ass. That's my that's my final thought. That's your final thought. That's 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 fair. Anything else? Anyone? I don't think I I think I went through all my I feel like I exhausted my my notes. Yeah, I I think the only thing I would have to say is that the homeless guy kind of had maybe the worst possible approach to getting her out of that house in his first scene. <laughs> and I I was like, oh, there's like Nazis in this neighborhood. Okay, like at first when I when I saw it happening, where it was like, get out of that house, girl. I was like, oh shit, there's like the clan up here or some shit. That's crazy. And then I found out that it was yeah, like not yeah. a white guy at all, and I was like, oh fuck, all right, interesting approach, bro. Yeah, he's, he's like just shouting and yelling at her in a neighborhood that she she had just been told the neighborhood was bad. Yeah. It's like so she's like, "Oh fuck, I got to this someone's running at me." When maybe if he's like, "Hey, excuse me, uh, ma'am. Um there's a, a crazy monster in the basement." Uh <laughs> Excuse me. Still though, like how do you how do you convince someone of crazy shit like that? Well, that's the thing. Like that's how like uh, you know Keith was not convinced. I mean, she wasn't aware of the monster, but she knew something was up. But like her concerns were valid. A camera in a bed in a CD basement is real life. That's that's totally believable. Yeah, and it wasn't like like there was yeah. anything set up. Like there wasn't like a couch. It was just like this guy's like running his own radio show downstairs. Like there's a bloody like handprint on the fucking wall. <laughs> yeah, and also that weird string you pull to open the door, like that was fucked. That up. shit was kind of tight, though. I want something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like I, that's how he was hiding his whole setup, right? Like he has this door you can't open unless you find the secret string. Secret layers are tight. <laughs> yeah, as as long as the secret layer is not hiding that, and it's hiding like you know. Yeah, as, as long as it's not an incest dungeon. No, yeah, I want to like build Legos and like hang out, but. Yeah, or if like you're like planning the overthrow of capitalism. Yeah, now like make memes and shit down there, but it's still secret. Right? All right. Well, I don't think I have anything else. But uh, again, Comrade Kitty Pie, uh, Jai Leftist, thank you for talking about this uh, this horror movie. It's been great. I had fun. Yeah, they, thank you for recommending it to me. Yeah, yeah. No, I think this is a, a horror movie in general. I mean, I definitely recommend it to anyone who who's into horror movies. But it's it's not like the same. It's like a, I feel like it's like genre expanding in a sense. It's not like a slasher movie or a you know a gory film. It has like it's it's like more of an art art piece. It, it felt a lot more like a like a thriller than it did really like a horror. Yeah, movie, you know I mean? yeah. I mean, the, the, we're in like the golden age, the new golden age of horror films. Oh, so, okay. you know, 
I, at least in my opinion. I think it's great. More layers. Yes, yes. Bringing back the layers to uh, to the horror genre. Anyway, all right. Well, uh, so everyone out there, you can um, listen to future episodes of Left to the Projector on your platform of choice. And thank you both again.